welcome to this week's edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. Unfortunately, Norwich City are not preparing for a trip to Arsenal this Sunday. English football remains on hold, the suspension in place with the coronavirus pandemic still being fought on all fronts around the country. I'm Dave Freezer coming to you from Sprouston, calling Paddy Davitt in Thorpe. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I forgot how to speak then, Dave. I don't know what I... <laughs> just because we're, visu- we're visually looking uh, on a split screen, I just thought I had to acknowledge you with a hand wave. So apologies, I'll, I'll audience. Picture. I'll paint the picture of a salute. And yeah. Connor Southwell in Tuxwood. Hello, hello. Tuxwood. There we go. I have acknowledged you. So You, you nearly <laughs> did, though. He did a hybrid. He moved his head, like nodding, and then he remembered <laughs> he had to yeah, talk. I did, so actually. Tony, Tony will be perfect when you introduce him. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and come in, Tony Thrussell in Bardersfield. Hello. <laughs> still ways. Still ways. S- slides in on his desk chair like he's in risky business or something. How are we, chaps? Uh, Pad, how's the uh, salvage wars, salvage hunters, whatever it's called? Do you know what? I'm, I'm completely oversold. I haven't watched one episode since <laughs> I actually mentioned that. <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't know what that really says um you, you I know don't what even it says know what, what what does it tell me tony what does that say that tv is just rubbish isn't it yeah I don't, it's not as if i don't recall i don't I'm, well i mean we've gone big my wife and i would designate survivor so maybe that's filling the gap on netflix ah. I'm not sure we want to promote that but uh that's what very season? good at the minute season two at the minute so um recommend that if anybody's struggling for a an as access my memories of that is watching that um, in the back of Paul's car whilst we were driving across Germany. Oh, right. Is that right? Yeah, I didn't realise that. I don't, we're a bit I more like this, though. Yeah. <laughs> that felt, that yeah. felt like an episode of Designated Survivor, that <laughs> yeah. Surviving the Autobahn. Yeah. <laughs> with on, PC on driving it. Um, Sunderland Till I Die is out today, isn't it? That's sort of. Gonna... Yeah. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Looking forward to that. See if Graban, um, Graban's moved on by now. By then, I would have thought, wouldn't he? Lewis Graban. Because he was one of the stars in the first, uh, yeah, yeah. first Forrest, episode, mm. so first Forrest series. Forget his name. Forrest, of course, yeah. The midfielder, Forrest, yeah. G- uh, Gibson. He, Darren he had, Gibson, yeah. yeah Gibson. Mm. Jack Rodwell. Rodwell, yeah. 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 So th- this is that. That's their first season in League One, is it? Sunderland. Yeah. Uh, when they went through more ownership yeah. stuff, didn't they? So. Yeah. Uh, Wembley twice. Yeah. You do get a bit bored of TV quite quickly, though. I don't, I don't think I've been watching as much TV as I thought I would be, to be honest. Trying to break it up with uh, bits and pieces. Uh, we've actually taken to... This, I don't know what this says about us pre all this stuff. Uh, but we're making sure that we eat dinner at the dinner table at the moment. Don't, nice. don't watch it in front of TV. Have a bit of music on, have a chat, have a catch-up about the day while we eat dinner at the dinner table. Which, yeah. which seems like a nice sort of old-fashioned luxury. I Very like sophisticated. It. Like it. Yeah, yeah, but... no, I wholeheartedly <laughs> yeah. agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a good one to use. Um, I've managed to get the girlfriend into Parks and Rec, though. If you've never seen that, very good American comedy. Um, highly gift online. Yeah, uh, you will all have seen a um, at least one gif, I'm yeah. sure, from Parks and Rec without realizing it. Um, but I'm also putting together a bit of a film list. Which I might put this out on Twitter at some point. I haven't, I haven't finished it yet. Uh, in terms of 10 films that I've never seen that I've always wanted to. So things like I've never seen The Godfather or Goodfellas or Blade Runner or The Terminator. I've never seen what? them. So I'm going to put together like a list of 10 films, make sure that I, I watch them during this break. So I think that could be an, a good think, little I one. I think Tyler uh... would have about 100 to 1,000. Yeah, I was, was going to say I could practice Star Wars or Lord of the Rings <laughs> during this time. <laughs> Yeah, Lord of the Rings is quite a commitment. <laughs> that I'd might not start be the best place to start. Well, I'm not, not sure I'll commit myself to, to either of those, to be honest, but you never know. I hadn't seen Lord of the Rings when I went to uni, and then in the second year, um, I revealed this, and so we decided to watch all three in 24 hours, which was pretty grueling. <laughs> is that the extended <laughs> but, ones as well? Uh, probably, yeah, because my housemate is a bit of a... Or, uh, was my housemate was a, a bit of an aficionado with it he had the box set and stuff but uh yeah needed, needed a couple of beers to get through to the end of that one but uh yeah but we're, we're all keeping all right basically everyone everyone feels like they're yeah, managing yeah. yeah been uh been delving into watched um rocket man on the weekend oh, that's good 
So I've been listening to a bit of Elton John lately and uh, now moving on to Queen in anticipation for watching Bohemian Rhapsody. Absolutely, yeah. Once, <laughs> once you've watched both of them, you just, you just listen to it loads on Spotify yeah. afterwards. I, really I forgot. How do you want to give, give us a burst? Got. Do you want to give us a burst of singing there, TT? Um, <laughs> sing us your favourite Elton John lyric. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't be shy. No, no. Be in shy. fairness, we've, we've been singing. I'm still standing. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Very nice. That's enough. That's enough. Move on. <laughs> so right. me. On to the football then, and uh, a bit of a sort of serious issue to deal with first. And there's a lot. There's, it's not been quiet at Norwich City. I know we've not had any football to talk about, um, not properly. But um, Pad, if I come to you, the, the club announced that they were furloughing staff on uh, Tuesday evening, yeah. if I've not yeah. lost track of days. And um, that is, that's off-field staff, the non-playing staff at the moment, isn't it? Correct, Dave. Yep. Um, increasingly, it looks to be the way a lot of football clubs are going. Uh, non-playing staff, that's the first thing to reiterate. And then the second thing in Norwich's case is, um, without getting into the nuts and bolts of the government, job retention scheme, they are topping up the difference between what the government have agreed to pay. So any of those staff who are affected by that in Norwich City will retain their full salary um, through a combination of the government assistance and the football club. Uh, And what that tells us is that, because obviously it sparked a predictable response, I think, on social media, it's safe to say that, that football and football clubs are an industry. Yes, they're an entertainment industry and some people don't view them as that, particularly if you're outside it. But inside it, they're, they've got employees, they have salaries that need to be met. Um, and clearly, increasingly, and I, I, I we sit here on Wednesday morning, I think by the end of the week, um, a lot more clubs will go down this route. Uh, and it probably underlines that football is an industry without any football is struggling. And, and the scheme is there, the help is there for businesses. Um, you can get into the moral arguments of um, a multi-billion pound industry, particularly where Norwich are at the minute in the Premier League, whether it's right to rely on government assistance. But um, the bottom line is, um, essentially, that they clearly feel, and Norwich's statement was very clear, that they need to protect jobs. This is a measure they feel will protect jobs and, and the long-term viability of, of, the, of, of the football club. And... Uh, we're only really getting to the start of this cycle of, of what the pandemic means for football. You know, and we always reiterate when we've talked about this on the pod that clearly it's about health and, and society's ability to try and deal with this and, and this phenomenal work that the NHS and health workers, key workers are doing. So that's the primary thing in all of this. But we're sat here, we're discussing a, a, a football club and what it means for, for that football club. And the reality is, there is a financial implication. You know, Stuart Webber did a podcast a few days ago, very open as always. Um, Norwich will be insulated to a better degree than a lot of other clubs because they are a self-funded operation. But even Norwich, this will be a, a massive financial shock because we're still not quite sure how football uh, responds in terms of what happens to the current season. You know, there's so many um, scenarios now getting thrown out there, but we still... As we said on the pod last week, the position is no football till April 30th at the earliest. There is another meeting planned on Friday uh, with the Premier League. I think we will now probably at that meeting see some clarity. That's the sense I get from speaking to people at the football club. And I think beyond Friday, we will probably know what the Premier League, what the Football League, what the PFA and the FA want to do in terms of completing this season. And then the offshoot of that is the financial implications and, and whether that's wage deferrals for players um, for the football staff around them, as well as where we are right here, right now, is non-football staff. So, very complex, very fast-moving situation, but uh, ultimately, um, Norwich have decided that for them, for their business model, this is the best way to go. Uh, but reiterating, I think, that they have agreed to top up those salaries so that none of those um, non-football staff who are furloughed, to use the terminology, will be out of pocket. Yeah, I mean, to... To quote Mr. Farker, let's not go too deep with it at the moment because it is still an evolving issue um, the, with players' wages, etc. That's sort of all been straightened out. So um, we can maybe hold judgment on, on things like that for a, a little while because as we sit here today, you know, you can talk about a mega club of, of you know, a Real Madrid or Manchester United. You would sort of expect that if their players can take 10% uh, wage cut, 
that should be covering um, off-field staff's wages and stuff. But until we sort of know the details of, of things, and they're going to be vastly different from club to club, as you say, Norwich is very different to a mega club like a, like a Real Madrid, then um, then we can sort of judge things from there. So that's one to keep an eye on. Uh, just before we crack on, I just want to remind you that we also come to you on Future Radio 107.8 FM. You can hear the, uh, the latest show on Wednesday evenings on Future. And um, I was also encouraged, actually, um, the, I was having to do these pods at home uh, just, just to sort of remind you that we are all in separate locations. So I hope the audio quality is um, OK. We're doing our best to sort of maintain that. Um, but as with so many people, we're all working from, from home at the moment. And I don't know if ever, any of you have ever watched John Oliver's show in America um, last week tonight. Um, but all, the, all those sort of chat show hosts, your James Corden, your Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, etc., John Oliver, they're all having to work from home at the moment as well. They're literally filming, you know, some of the world's biggest topical news shows on mobile phones and things like that and managing to pull it together. So. So we're uh, we're not on our own in having to sort of pull things uh, together in, in a slightly unusual way. But Connor, uh, the big news: Todd Cantwell is out of the FIFA tournament. Talk us through it. I mean, we're all devastated, aren't we? I, 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 am. I've, I am. I mean, since since he's since he's uh, got knocked out, I've struggled to sort of get out of bed. To be honest, it's, <laughs> it's hit me really hard. Um, yeah, he got knocked out by standard Lu- uh, Liège in the end, so it was a European tie at least. Um, mm. I think they were playing with a professional esports player who uh, uh, was perhaps being a. Uh, I think I'll use the term he was, he was managing the game well. Um, he, he basically scored fairly early on and was was just keeping possession. And uh, that, Todd did yeah. that against Stevenage, though, didn't he? He did, yeah, he did to an extent. So it's 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 it is what it is really. I think he, he was probably a bit fortunate to get through the the last round. Um, in in if if truth be told, but yeah, I think whenever you come up against a professional, it's it's always going to be incredibly difficult. And uh, yeah, so it's so an origin knocked out. Although I think Standard Liège are into the quarterfinals, which is the stage you're at now. So um, who knows? He might have been beaten by the eventual winner. It wouldn't wouldn't really surprise me, I don't think. But yeah, devastating news for everyone involved, really, um, and and especially for. I mean, that's the closest we're we're going to get to football for a while. Um, and it was relatively entertaining as well. You sort of got his commentary as well. Um, which is quite interesting. So, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a shame, but um, I, I probably won't lose any sleep over it if I'm being completely honest. Absolutely, just good to see Norwich back in European football, really. It's it's, been, yeah, it's, that's it's, that's the main thing, isn't it? Yeah. How, how are Reading doing on uh, on your save? More importantly, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I've I've ditched them. Um, oh. I've, I've gone. I've gone. I sort of fell out of love with it a little bit and uh, decided to, to venture into the non-leagues. I've, uh, I've set myself a <laughs> task of setting, setting Maidstone back to the football Does this league. mean you were sacked? Um, I wouldn't possibly comment. <laughs> but uh, Is this the same save or a new one? No, it's a new one. No, it's ah, a new okay. one. So uh, I've set myself a new challenge to get Maidstone back in the Football League. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I'll keep you updated. It's going well so far. I'm about five games from, from the title, I think, as we stand. So fingers crossed. <laughs> Well, other big news at the weekend: the goat turned thirty. Timu Pukki celebrating his thirtieth birthday, so that um, that was a nice opportunity to dig out his goals. Of course, lovely and apt that he scored thirty goals last season. Of course, so the club were quick to pump that one out. Um, the FA Cup, uh, the organisers of the FA Cup, have confirmed the intention is to complete that competition. Uh, Tony, what do you make of that one? Um, in terms of the FA Cup, I guess the league has got to take precedence in terms of whenever they are able to resume. Um, you know, we we wait for the next update on that, which could be weeks away. But I guess I, I have seen the idea floated that the FA Cup could potentially be sort of almost a pre-season competition ahead of next season. And where, where do you think the FA Cup sort of has to stand in terms yeah. of priority? Well, immediately, that's what I thought. It, to put the teams in it, it, it basically could act as a mini tournament that they do anyway, um, mm. but with something riding on it. And I mean, if they ditch the... Community Shield again as well. That's that's a, a day at Wembley lost. So it makes sense. I mean, what are we at the quarters now? So that's only mm. four games plus the semi six plus the final seven games. I mean, it's doable. there's no there's no need really to ditch that, even if it is happening at the start of the season. If they get rid of the League Cup, maybe something like that. I don't know. And then it's, it's going to be interesting because. It's not just the big competitions. It's it's as Connor was talking about non-league, uh, the VARS, the FA Trophy, um, the what's the the EFL Cup, the mm. 
the old that's the old Johnson's paint, isn't it? Yeah, the AFL trophy. That's uh, yeah. Sean Raggett's in that with Portsmouth, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I mean even the the under twenty threes in the academy have have they mentioned anything about them yet? Because I mean they're in countless competitions as well. Yeah, I, I guess as they're not competitive, that that yeah. that'll just go by the wayside, and they will will it maybe play friendlies where, during the summer just to get back up to speed. But um, yeah, I guess that's pretty low priority. But um, it, it will be um, when Norwich eventually, if the cup does go on, play Man United at Carrow Road for that quarter final. It's going to be special, but in mm. a different way. It's going to be very, very different to how it would have been two weeks ago when it was meant to be played. Potentially, yeah. Obviously, with the sort of background threat of um, of being played behind closed doors and being streamed and things like that, let's just let's hope it doesn't come to that. I, I think the general feeling is if they can avoid doing that, then do it. But um, yeah, it's a week by week thing in terms of that. Um, other stuff with Norwich, um, we've already spoken about that. They've been calling sort of older fans. I've seen quite a few comments on Twitter still flowing through about people getting calls from the players. I'm sure that will carry on. Um, Crystal Zimmerman penned a really nice open letter, which we had on the back page of Monday's Evening P. Daniel Farker put out a nice video over the weekend. Um, Tom Smith as well, a club director. He's also a trustee for CSF, the, the Community Sport Foundation. So, the club are doing lots to uh, sort of keep in touch. Um, but you did mention that Stuart Webber interview, Pad. Um, yes. And there was, uh, uh, we're all talking about what DVDs and TV we're watching. I'd imagine he's watching lots of DVDs in terms of scouting at the moment. And it looks like South America somewhere that um, they're looking at. Yeah, I think uh, that that is uh, slightly, slightly disconcerting to say that they're looking at it in the sense that they aren't already there. I won't give away, but I spoke to one of the owners and... Uh, at Christmas, when we all had a, fun enough, that was around that academy evening um, when the academy guys were cooking dinner for <laughs> well, us. When we saw them probably. singing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, quite a memorable <laughs> evening. Um, well, I think it was mainly we, we were attached to the evening, but it was mainly about the families and the foster families. And just a thank you. But it just stuck in my head that uh, they, I was told that they do have two scouts in that part of the world. And that was back then. So clearly reading between the lines what Stuart Webber has said in recent days, they're now looking at that as probably something they need to beef up rather than go go into that territory for the first time. So it's interesting. Uh, and the fact that he volunteered it as well. Um, and let's be honest, I know he came via Spain, but if you can find a few Emmy Buendias before they've even hit European shores, then uh, that could be a very profitable uh, recruitment channel. But um, yeah, on a broader point, he, he made the, Stuart made the point that, Clearly, they're not able to meet in person, but there's nothing, as we're demonstrating here now, technology-wise, to stop them ramping up things that probably, if we'd have been in the ebb and flow of, as we've discussed, FA Cup games or Premier League games, um, these things wouldn't have happened. So I think, as a lot of businesses are doing, it's an opportunity to focus on areas that maybe they probably would have only uh, looked at it over in the summer, in the close season. And one of those, yep, is recruitment. Um, but of course, the caveat with all of that is nobody knows. You know, I've seen in the last few days they've been linked again with one or two players and complete Jack and Ori if they're back in the championship because the, the finances involved with these type of players aren't going to happen. So, as always, with with anything to do with re- re- recruitment for Norwich, particularly, it hinges on what league they're going to be in, and nobody quite knows at the moment. But yeah, yeah, would you expect anything less from Stuart Webber? We all know how he's, uh, particularly in regard to transfers. He's not a person who, who works on the hoof or, or is reactive. They put plans in place. Buendi is the, the, the fine example. You know, the, the window before he came in, they wanted to do that deal. So, you know, it just it's just consistent with how Stuart Webber and his rec- recruitment uh, team work. And uh, the fact that they are now looking at markets they're not actually in at the minute is, uh, is probably just par for the course. So, yeah, an interesting insight into to what's going on um, in lieu of any actual football. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one that sticks in my mind has always stuck in my mind from last January was a lad in Uruguay called Nicolas Acevedo, uh, who was playing for Liverpool Montevideo. And the reason that sticks in my mind is because uh, I think it was only me and Mark Armstrong in the office that day, and we started having a look at this guy because there was a link, and we thought, oh, this sounds interesting. Uruguay under twenty midfield, uh, link with a few bigger clubs and stuff like that as well. But we noticed a player had scored nine goals in a game. Um, and he has gone on to be rather 
rather good. Uh, the lad now p- smashing them in for Dortmund, Alfie Inge Haaland's son, um, who is becoming a uh, sort of world superstar very quickly, isn't he? So that was only just over a year ago, and that was, I think, for Norway in, in the World Under-20 Championship. He scored nine goals in a game. So uh, his name is <laughs> sort of stuck in my head um, and uh, from, from that. But, yeah, interesting that they're, um, they're scouting that side of things. Connor, um, a couple of in, uh, interviews you've picked up on. Uh, Alex Tetty has been talking about how he may well be retiring um, when his contract expires with Norwich. Um, mm-hmm. Max Ahrens as well has done a quite a lengthy interview with a, with a separate podcast as well, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Uh, the Max the Max Aaron's one was good. I think Pad's probably better to speak about the, the Teddy stuff because uh, he, he, he did that yesterday. But um, in, in terms of Max Aaron, yeah, there's was, was lots of good stuff in there, actually. Um, he spoke about the, the Tottenham win and, and uh, also uh, his expectation for the season that he put on himself and spoke about how the club have sort of managed him and handled him and told him to go and play with freedom. And, and they're sort of aware that that might mean that he makes a mistake or two and he uh, he highlighted the uh, one against Manchester United where he pushed up too high and Marcus Rashford ran him beyond um, as, as a great example of that because he said the risk is that you, you go and support the attack but equally you can get caught out at the other end and it's almost that there's the environment now at, at Norwich that allows players to play with that freedom and he spoke about how important that's been for his development. He was, he was quite grateful actually. I think he, he came across to the club and and, and and their handling of him, I suppose. He's he's still so young. I mean, it's ridiculous to think he only broke in last season and, and to consider how far he's come in that space of time is incredible, really. Um, he spoke about his relationship with Emi Buendia down the right as well, which is interesting about how initially they struggled to communicate because of the language barrier, but how it's much better now. And uh, he, was, he was raving about Emi Buendia and, and, and his attributes as well. So there's, there's, there was plenty in there. He later went on to speak about England and... And different and different things like that. So um, very very insightful um, and 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 good stuff from from Max. And uh, yeah, it was it's, it's nice to hear from him because he's someone that, that perhaps we we hear from in short bursts. Sometimes we we hear a lot in a, a short space of time and then not a lot for a while. But yeah, he's he's a, he's got a, a head on those shoulders for sure. And uh, he's certainly very grateful to Norwich, which is I think nice to hear and almost a nice perspective on because we hear those academy guys get linked with move sort of consistently really this season it's it's nice to hear them actually um pay tribute to Norwich and, and how they've handled and, and how they've handled their development which is which is good to hear yeah and with Tetty um I spoke to him after that defeat at Wolves which was a pretty grim day wasn't he that was when he came out with his line oh maybe I should give the new contract back um to sort of break the mood a little bit but one thing that did stand out is that that day is that he told Stuart Webber he doesn't want a testimonial or anything. And this will take him, uh, you know, if he sees through that contract, that will have been nine years with the club. But those comments in Norway were, were pretty much, pretty sort of succinct, weren't they? And that he's probably going to retire 2021. He will, yeah. And um, he's clearly a guy who knows that he's coming to the end. He talks about in that article um, about he's got one knee that is particularly... Um, needs to be managed carefully, can't play on artificial surfaces. So, you know, he'll be 34 going on 35, I think, by then, um, particularly in the top two tiers in England. It probably is a big ask. But interestingly, he's ruling out, you know, going back to Norway, there was a lot of talk before he signed, not this deal, but the one before at Norwich, that he might go back and finish at Rosenberg, his first club. Uh, no, he won't be doing that. He says um, he's done with Norwegian football. He's done with football. So, Savour him while we can. I think if you're a Norwich fan, and obviously at the minute nobody knows when we get back on the pitch. But uh, yeah, he he is in the end game, and um, nine years at this stage of football is no mean feat. Whether he gets a testimonial or not, I think that's more a, a window into the man's character. He's uh, he's one of those who doesn't push himself forward. He'd rather be in the background. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure if everything turns out as it does, and that we get to this stage next season as it would be. Um, then you know he will be he will be recognised for for his service and what he's done and he's been a constant in a, a very ever changing period of the football club and uh, you know it's only been underlined this season that he is still he's not it's not a, a charitable sort of a act to keep him in and around the place he is still quite an essential cog in that Norwich midfield in the central areas there's nobody really who offers what he does and he has embellished what we know he can do in terms of combativeness with. I think 
by most people's admissions, his work on the ball is a lot more polished um, since he's been working with Daniel Farker. So for me, he's still uh, he's still a guy who can do a job, and while he can still do a job, then and uh, and you get the sense you'd say you've spoken to him there, and anybody who has spoken to him, I think he is one of those. If he feels he can do a job, he'll stay around. Maybe he thinks by the time of the end of this contract, um, given the physical things he's referenced again, um, then it's probably. He knows himself, and and most players know when it's time to knock it on the head. Um, fair play to him that he's come out and said it now. So there won't be any, you know, dance about will he, won't he? We all know now that come summer twenty twenty one, that is the end of Alex Tete as a football player. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Whether he's preemptively thought, let's get this out there so we don't have all this contract talk again because he's done been through it twice already, isn't he? So, um, yeah, that's interesting and. Um, uh, that he seems like he wants to go back to Norway. No sort of talk of, yeah, I'll be a coach or something like that. Oh, maybe, maybe we'll be over there. When when he signed his new contract, I did work out some stats that, like, off the top of my head, it was the, uh, prior to the Daniel Farker, uh, prior to Daniel Farker arriving at Norwich City, his past success completion was around 82%. And then since Daniel Farker's been here, it's been around 87%. So um, Daniel has improved that side of his game, hasn't he? But um, Tony, I just checked. It's his birthday on Saturday, 34th birthday on Saturday. So um, that's one for the socials. <laughs> um, talking of which, the pink and poser did quite well last week and um, got lots of responses from you guys. Um, I'll come to you about the Twitter World Cup in just a second, Tony. But we had a, um, we've had a few articles going, haven't we, in terms of it's a bit of a blank page for, for us as a sports desk at the moment in terms of we can look back on pretty much anything we want. So. We've had this cult hero series going. The last few I uh, read were Arturo Lupoli, Jordan Rhodes, Andy Linegan, um, all quite different, um, quite varied. Um, but a few others that were suggested to us on Twitter. Uh, Chris Parker, not an obscure one really, but Leon McKenzie goes down as my favourite and quite possibly the first of my time supporting Norwich. Kevin Platt suggests Tevin, uh, sorry, Trevor Hockey, Martin O'Neill, Andy Linegan and Louis Donoa. And Kevin Brown said Ian Crook, Phil Boyer, Ted McDougall and Daryl Russell, which sort of shows, as we discussed last week, that a cult hero definition is quite a personal thing in terms of what, what you consider it to be. But the um, the Twitter competition, Tony, uh, produced a winner. Yes, it was a uh, it was a I think I don't think it was a closely fought final, actually. Um, it was 58 percent, ju- wasn't it? It's just, let me just scroll back. Sorry, technical difficulties. I've got here 58% <laughs> yeah, and 58. over 300 votes in the final. Yeah, so, I mean, it, definitely not as close as some of the, the sort of quarters and round of 16s. But, yeah, Robert Fleck came up trumps against Simeon Jackson. Um, but, yeah, it, interestingly, Jackson had a relatively easy route. He had Lupoli <laughs> and Safri. I mean, and obviously what Jackson did um, in that season when they got promoted lives long in the memory. And Fleck beating the icon and Jordan Rhodes. So um, two players that are liked for different reasons, but Fleck obviously was here for a longer, did a lot more for the club. So, it, I mean, it's pretty pretty sure in that he was going to win that, I think, looking at the, the list of names we were sent in. But... I was surprised Cody McDonald beat David Nielsen. I, I thought Nielsen was more popular than Cody, but I guess I don't know. <laughs> I'm just having a quick look in the book that I've got here, just so we can mention the uh, stats for Robert Fleck, because he had two spells with the club, didn't he? And where is it? Robert Fleck. I can't find him in here. Uh, maybe he's got moved into the 90s. Yes. Where are you? Oh, my book's falling apart. <laughs> yeah, I see on Wikipedia you had two spells. Here we go. Right, so uh, 299 games, 84 goals, which I think uh, puts him top five, doesn't it, for the all-time goal scorers as well. Um, sold to Chelsea for 2.1 million in 92, came back for about 650,000 in 95. So, yeah. Two spells at the club, definitely. Um, for, for a lot of people, Fleck goes down as, as a legend, doesn't he? And doesn't come into that cult hero status. But some of the um, 
responses that we've got, which I'm just going to read through here, sort of show why um, Flecky is remembered as as a cult hero as well. Because I think it's it's not necessarily about the achievement on the pitch. It's, it's about the character and about how you remember yeah. them. So uh, n- oh, these are all from Twitter. Norwich fan Gagan Rex, with City leading, taking an age to walk off the pitch after being substituted uh, against Manchester City. And just before he gets on the edge of the pitch, bends down to replace a divot. Uh, that's that sort of cheeky attitude, which I think he's well remembered for, isn't it? Um, Martin James Rainbow says, I may have imagined this, but I'm sure he nicked a Mars bar from the man selling sweets, chocolates and hot drinks with a trolley as he walked around the pitch, which is backed up by Ed Tomlinson, who says, I was there. It was a few <laughs> feet from me as a boy. It was a wonderful moment. He then pushed the trolley, shouting sweets, doing a good impression of the usual seller. Uh, Dave Hansel says, being sat in the ball boys room, um, looking at him wide-eyed, open-mouthed and too mesmerised to speak as he signed multiple copies of Match magazine. And this is one which uh, has really been doing the rounds on social as well. Shakespeare Canary, scoring the winner away at Millwall at the Den. Match was live on ITV in March 1989. What a goal. And it was a great goal. I saw that on Twitter the other day. Um, sort of snap shot from the edge of the box which went into the roof of the net. Um, I was in the away penalty, uh, in the away pen, sorry, wearing a white jumper that my mum had to knit me to keep me warm in my student days. The stanchions for the floodlights were part of the terracing. And Steve Carman just pleased his football was better than his dancing at Ritzy's on a Saturday night. Which is, uh, was a nightclub on Tombland, which is now a lobster place. Um, but Craig Trudgill says, bit, a bit disrespectful to call him a cult hero amongst the other players on the list, should be among the best players we've ever had. So that sort of um, sh- throws that bit of light onto it. But Michael Nelson got involved, didn't he? Uh, Alex Moore said, I can't believe Michael Nelson's been robbed. Absolute daylight, tagging in Nelson. And the big man said, the world's gone mad, mate. So, <laughs> that that happy. Yeah. Right, let's bring you on to the new Pink and Poser then. Um, and we're looking for your responses ahead of next week. We'll read out the best of them in next week's pod. And this week, we are talking about worst matches. When you think about the worst match you've ever seen, uh, let's take it to Norwich City, because there's been some pretty bad England ones over the years. What springs to mind? Um, who wants to go first? I'll go first, boys. I'm, uh, I'm purely, this is my Norwich uh, professional watching hat on. Uh, and worst, I mean, we could always all pick big defeats or painful mill wall away early in the Farker reign, per se. But I've defined it as uh, I want my money back. And given we don't pay to get in the ground, then uh, that's probably a bit cheeky. But uh, if <laughs> a game where you would demand to have your money back because it was the most paint, watching paint dry was more uh, amenable. And that would be, for me, 30th of December, 2017, Burton Albion, nil, Norwich, nil. Oof, that uh, was bad. So straight away, first thing there, December the 30th, it's that midweek fixture over Christmas, which I can never get my head around why the authorities, football authorities, need to slot something in between Boxing Day and New Year's Eve slash New Year's Day. It's after the Lord Mayor's show, and boy, was it. Um, I think Farker made four or five changes. He had Madison and Pritchard on the bench. So there's that's two creative players in that pool of uh, Norwich players, uh, both on the bench until the last quarter. Uh, I've got the stats here. Amazingly, I'm amazed that there was actually four shots on target, two for each side. I don't remember that. What I do remember is James Husband going through. Um, <laughs> I knew and, you were going to say this. <laughs> yeah, and Wes absolutely blasting. Was it because he didn't go down when, we, when he should have had a penalty or there was a hand? No, he died. So, no, he died. died from yeah, penalty, that's it, yeah. When he should, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Wes absolutely gave him down the banks. Um, and that is my only abiding memory of that and being quite cold, quite a. Um, condensed press area at Burton as well, quite a small stadium, all told, but um, cheek by jowl in the press box and to have to go to Burton middle Saturday of Christmas to watch that. I know it's my job, but no. Nah. So that, that forevermore <laughs> will be the, the worst game I have seen covering Norwich in recent memory. That was That's certainly my... one of the worst quality that stands out in my mind. It was an atrocious yeah. game. It was, like, exactly. it was like a proper football team trying to play a park team and it was just horrific. <laughs> Uh, Tony, what what stands out for you? Yeah, I I want to take you back to the second of October two thousand and seven. Um, picture Peter Grant's reign, um, Scunthorpe visit Carrow Road, 
and it's a drab nil-nil affair. Norwich haven't scored in four games and they slip into the relegation zone. Um, what I remember about this game, it was an evening kickoff um, and it was cold. And it probably around 80 minutes I'd had enough. And that was I used to go with my mum back then and she, she'd never left a game early. And I, I left early, but I had to wait for her at the car because she refused to leave early with me. <laughs> <laughs> Get on that. <laughs> just, to make, just to make a statement. Um, but I just remember it was, it was pretty dire. And that, that was sort of the peak of that run where Norwich couldn't win. And then eventually he got sacked at the end of that month, didn't he? And Brody came in. Um, but just to give you an idea of the lineup, the, some of the players involved Ot Semabor, Ian Murray, um, Rossi Jarvis, Dublin and Curitan up front. Um, and you've even got a Chris Brown on the bench. Oh, Chris Brown. He yeah. is one of the worst players I've ever seen play for Norwich. And then he, he kept he, coming back and scoring, didn't he? Yeah, he never used to score for Norwich, did he? Yeah. Uh, was it for Preston? He came and scored a winner one day, wasn't it? And everyone was just like, groan <laughs> you could have could have predicted that happening yeah he was he was pretty bad yeah that it not necessarily a heavy defeat it's it's those drab draws where you know from 20 minutes in that neither team's going to score and why are you doing this yeah <laughs> lovely stuff uh connor over to you yeah, for me, I've, I've gone back to uh, the 12th of January 2013 uh, and it's it must have been dull because I'm, I'm struggling to find any match report on it. But it was uh, Norwich City against Newcastle United at Carrow Road in the Premier League. Uh, I think Tim Krull was in goal for, for Newcastle that day and it was it was terrible. I mean, I'm, I'm reading a, a match report here uh, and it says uh, this was a match of very little quality and while lack of confidence and managerial caution played their part, creativity was painfully absent. Which I think is is quite an apt uh, summary of it. It was it was really cold. Um, it was it was a terrible game of football. Uh, there was very little to shout about in terms of shots. I think Chris Shooting was the Norwich manager, um, and it was it was just cold, dull, and uh, it's it's a day that I I just always remember for being really drab and and really void of any quality whatsoever from either side. Um, and yeah, it's uh, now now Paddy said it that Burton one is is probably stands out more recently but that, that is one I'll always go to in terms of worst games because it was it was just dreadful oh dear right I am going FA Cup and what turned out to be well it may turn out to be the final ever visit to Gig Lane for Norwich to play Bury. 15th of January 2008 I was still at uni and uh, I was in uni in Stoke so it was only sort of an hour up the road and as we were sports journalism students we quite often would just go to random games here or there and everywhere just to just to watch some football uh, FA Cup third round replay. Uh, this was weirdly, this was during the early stages of Glen Roder's reign um, when they went 13 games unbeaten. And I, I guess that they just really didn't want this game looking back at that run because this was right in the middle of it. And that they basically were just trying to trying to get out of the competition so they could focus on their survival battle, which did prove successful. That was when things were going reasonably well under Glen Roder. And they lost 2-1 and only because Dion Dublin pulled back a late goal in the 86th minute. And it was foggy. There were 4,000 people there. Uh, players are in the Norwich team that day. David Marshall was in goal. I think he made a mistake for the first one. Michael Spillane started. Ryan Bertrand was playing at left back. Uh, Matty Patterson, Mark Fotheringham. Hux played in that one. Uh, that is Ryan or Rossi Jarvis. Not sure which one Ryan Jarvis was playing. So, um, but what makes it stand out in my memory more is that, as I say, I went with my mates from uni, one of whom, my, uh, one of my housemates was an Ipswich fan. Um, you may remember the chap who was in that Sky Sports documentary alongside me from the Ipswich angle, Isaac, but refused to come in the Norwich end, obviously. So he went and sat in the home end. But the stand to our left was completely empty in the second half because everybody which doesn't happen very often everybody m moved at half time to go up the other end to watch the end that um that Berry was shooting you know they kept moving to and from so when Berry scored the goals in the first half or scored their goal in the first half he was just sat on his own with another of our mates celebrating that Berry <laughs> had scored against Norwich just to wind me up and just pointing <laughs> at me in the away end and all the fans around me must have been thinking, who is that nut job? <laughs> <laughs> Just on his own. But um, the one other thing that I also remember is Mo Kamara came on. He was a left back on loan from Derby. Like in injury time, 
had bombed forward to try and sort of create something. They're trying to get a late equaliser, got to the very penalty box. Two defenders stood him up and then he turned round, started going backwards, had no one to pass to. So just kept coming backwards and backwards and was running towards the away end. They were just screaming at him to go back in the other direction and not happy at all. So that, in terms of games, is one that has always stood out as being a terrible one. So over to you, listeners. Um, let us know your worst match, why it stands out for you. If you we'll put a, a couple of tweets out about it if you want to reply to them or get in contact with us personally, or uh, you can drop me an email on david.freezer at archon.co.uk, and we'll go through the best of them next week. Right, just to finish up then, boys, um, obviously I'm still cracking on with our news colleagues, but you've been keeping busy. Um, who have you been speaking to, Connor? It seems like you've been getting through quite quite a few. Yeah, I'm working my way down a very long list. Uh, Damien Francis. I spoke to him recently, yeah. which is a very interesting one. Uh, he doesn't really speak a lot about Norwich. So it's good to catch up about with, with him about sort of his view on his departure and perhaps how he's perceived by Norwich fans. And uh, that that was that was very interesting, very uh, enlightening as well for for him to tell his side of the story. Um, I'm trying to think who else I've spoken to now. It might be the only one this week. Ask you. Ask you last week, well, yeah. which we spoke about last week, didn't we? Um, so yeah, I think it might have been just been Damien Francis this week, but uh, yeah, we've got plenty more of those to come um, and some good ones as well. So uh, yeah, that that will be good to to catch up with some guys who uh, who are remembered perhaps fondly and then equally not so fondly because you have to you have to balance it out. It's nice to get people with different stories, I think. So um, so yeah, we're, we're we're getting through a few at the moment. It's it's nice to be able to speak to people that perhaps usually we we wouldn't be able to yeah. in the course of a season. So. Um, as obviously bleak as this period is, I think you've, you've got to try and find some sunshine from somewhere. So that's that's a positive aspect to it. Yeah, um, Francis' stuff was good. Um, as he admitted himself, he's never really come out and talked to Norwich fans about yeah. what went wrong for him. So um, that was good to hear that side of stuff. Um, there was a good quiz, talking to Glenn Roder a minute ago. Um, our colleague David Hannon put this together. The 20 loan players signed during Glenn Roder's era. Can you name them all? I won't mention any of the names to give it away, but I only got 10 out of 20, which I was quite quite disappointed four. with. Four? I've got okay. eight. Yeah, there were some, some names I was like, yeah. yeah. No idea. No. Jimmy um, Smith. Don't Redding give them away. Hot, hot <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Reading was a hot bed of talent back then, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. there was another one as well that I did remember. But yeah, I only got 10, so he can, he can beat 10. Also okay. on social media, 4,000 days since Ipswich beat Norwich. Uh, Pad, you've uh, had a bit of fun with this one? Yeah, yeah, we saw that yesterday, Tuesday. Um, well, Tony probably should come in here because we've got another World Cup on the go at the minute. Ah, so yes. Tell us about it. Tell us about it, TT. Well, currently the quarterfinals is uh, 30 minutes away from, from the votes being counted. Um, but it's, we've got clear winners at the moment. Um, we've just chosen the best eight moments Pretty since. much the, since since the last defeat where John Stead uh, scored the winner um, 4,000 days ago. So a bit of joy for town fans remembering that, but more joy for us remembering seven wins and five draws, 12 unbeaten. Um, plenty, yeah, plenty going out today to sort of look back on that. Um, get your votes in. I'm sure. What's, uh, what, what, are the, what what's the semi-final makeup looking like? We we stress it's, it's still ongoing, but at yeah, yeah. At the moment, four-one uh, Holt hat tricks beating the Johnson Rocket game, uh, which is understandable. So far, the Wembley uh, that's Wembley game, so playoff semi-final has a hundred percent of the votes against the Graben winner, the header, at <laughs> the road, right? Which is understandable. <laughs> Yeah, which is um, a terrible goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit cheeky though that one. Um, Ipswich five one is well ahead of Madison's uh, winner. Yeah, and this, this is the good one actually. Uh, last season's Lambert's meltdown is up against Closer's equaliser. Yeah, and uh, that's just shading it fifty four percent, which which is good actually because it's nice to see uh, something that isn't necessarily about the game; it's about that moment. Is beating yeah. uh, an emphatic win last year. So, so yeah, I, I mean, prediction Wembley, that's Wembley might win it, but let's see. I swear, yeah, my money would go there. I think that'll take some beating. That second leg at Car yeah. Road, just epic. I think the only thing that trumps that in history is probably the Bruce uh, FA yeah. uh, Milk Cup semi final. Sorry. 
Yeah. yeah, there's that. I was at Portman Road for the top of the league at Portman Road, yeah. 2003, with Leon McKenzie double. That was a great day. But yeah, the playoffs, um, that was pretty epic, wasn't it? Um, so that's 4,000 days since Ipswich have beaten Norwich. And then later this year, it'll be 10 years unbeaten for Norwich, won't it? It'll be 10 years since the um, since that 4-1 win. Um, so, yeah, get involved in that on Twitter if you haven't already. Uh, there was a transfer rumour as well, wasn't there, yesterday? Um, who wrote this one, Paddy or Connor? Uh, Jack Tucker at Gillingham? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Southall. Mm. Yeah, Jack Tucker sick. at Gillingham. I've got a little bit of a scouting report for you, so I'm just, I'll just get that together. But just remind okay. the listeners of who this is. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a young lad at Gillingham. Uh, Steve Evans speaks very highly of him. I think he's he's 20. He was a guy that uh, initially, before Evans came into the club, that they were actually going to release. And uh, Evans has sort of turned him into, I, I would imagine, sort of a stereotype in a Steve Evans side that he's, he's probably a big no-nonsense defender. But um, so, so in terms of raw characteristics, then he's, he's probably fairly good defensively. He's been linked with uh, Celtic, West Ham, Southampton. Um, it's an interesting time for a transfer rumour, though. It kind of feels mm. a little bad, given we don't know when the next window is going to be or what that window is going to be like, because um, a lot of clubs are going to be obviously looking after their finances at the moment. And the implications of that could be that the prices get dragged down in, in a transfer window or we could see clubs go the other way. So it's it's so hard to predict, um, which makes it, again, a bit interesting. And, and Gillingham are, are a good example of that because they've essentially had to go through all the processes that we're seeing in terms of um, furloughing staff and um, cutting wages and, and, and whatnot and, and uh, they've, they've essentially said that that's going to have to be made up with player sales in, in the summer and he's going to be a prime uh, target I think for, for a lot of clubs so this kind of feels like maybe if, if I was to analyse it as a rumour as them telling the agent look maybe just push his name out there a little bit and see what comes back but um, I'm always a bit sceptical when it's Norwich and five other clubs anyway so yeah, yeah. Um, but from what it looks like a top young talent obviously fits the bill in terms of what Norwich look for in, in terms of recruitment so um, I wouldn't knock it down completely but uh, yeah it's it's an interesting one and, and the, time of, the timing of it is, is probably more interesting uh, for me to be honest. Right well I've, I've compiled an extensive scouting report on this lad because one of my mates is a Gillingham fan. So, um, as is Ben Kensel, I believe. Um, so, he may well have, uh, <laughs> he may well be having a word with uh, the scouting department. Anyway, I asked my mate, Jack Tucker, any good? And he said, very. In terms of impact on the first team straight away, the best we've had in terms of homegrown. You stay away, it's club exclamation mark. <laughs> Takes all of our deep free kicks, very composed on the ball. Reading of the game is sensational. Always seems to be in the right place. And uh, he says that they also turned down a 1.5 million bid from an unnamed championship club in January. So he's clearly someone that's um, that's doing rather well. But um, we can add him to the list. Um, <laughs> whether that will ever become a realistic rumour, we'll probably have to see further down the track. But it's always nice to keep us entertained, I suppose. <laughs> Keeps um, us busy. Nothing else. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. I think we wrap it there, boys. Thank you very much. Um, good work ploughing on with uh, with everything. I hope all you guys listening are, are enjoying the stuff that um, the Sports Desk are, are still putting out in what are obviously quite challenging circumstances at the moment. But we'll keep uh, we'll keep plugging away with the pod every week as well. Keep in touch with you guys. Hope that a few familiar voices are, are welcome. Um, just to give a, a, a quick plug, the EDP and Evening News have launched a, a campaign called Not Alone, which you. Um, well, you may well have seen on my uh, social media feeds. Um, I've been involved with the, the launch of that. And that is just quite literally trying to encourage plenty of positivity around. I've got lots of people who are sort of involved in mental health campaigning, including Cedric Anselan, former Norwich player, and John Norman, who's City's club chaplain, uh, among other things, um, who are sort of the, among the high profile backers, Norman Lamb, the former MP as well. So um, that is quite literally just trying to encourage positivity and make sure that people don't feel uh, that they are alone at this uh, difficult time when we're all socially isolating. And hopefully the Pinkin podcast flows into that nicely. Right. Paddy, Tony, Connor, thanks very much. Look after yourselves. Thank you, listeners. And we will catch up with you very soon.